With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell. Okay, he's one of our favorites. We've just never had to call him this before because... He was working under his gimmick, the artist formerly known as Jericho Hill, Stephen Popick, uh, an economist at one of those four-letter, not three-letter uh, places of government. I don't know. Should we say malfeasance, fiscal fortitude? What do you say? What do you call those kind of organizations where it's a bunch of letters and a lot of government money? Um, great employment. Great employment. <laughs> Good work if you can get it, as they would say in the business. Uh, great to see you, buddy. He uh, had been writing anonymously. Some things happened in his life. He is now out. I got exposed. a couple of publications that uh, raised the profile a bit, so I decided that it was time to uh, take on a new name. Yep, and he's got a very high-profile thing we're going to talk about on some future episode just as soon as the legal stuff gets cleared up. We'll get to that hopefully in a couple of weeks. My uh, friend, oh, spoiler, spoiler alert, I think we're going to be cleared up. Good deal. I can't wait. Let, tease it, tease it, tease it. Don't don't, don't, don't give away the ending just yet. Over um, the summer, I had the opportunity to uh, serve as a testifying expert in a, in a trial. Yeah, I can't wait to get into that with you, too. We'll get you back on that pretty soon. But let's go to your Ballywick. Let's talk some economics the cpi came out let's start with the nomenclature because everybody freaked out um a lot of people got a lot of clicks and notice over it i just took the little um first page reading of it and i just read it straight on this program because i thought that was the fairest way to do it because i thought it was actually pretty concise and pretty easy to understand if you just read the press release now the actual report's like 27 pages of pdf so that's a little more detailed tell people what this is why it matters and what it does as far as it goes to inflation yeah, so the, that, I think that's great, Andrew. And I think it's nice to say that, yeah, the CPI press release that the BLS puts out is, is designed to be understandable for non-geeky numbers people like me. So we we were hoping that CPI would fall. Um, we were hoping that the gas prices uh, and other energy changes and some of these other supply chain issues working themselves out would Finally, we'd see those pressures that we've been seeing building to, you know, push the CPI down and it would get pushed down. And the good news is that, yeah, the things that we expected to push it down were pushing the CPI down. The sort of want, want moment uh, is that shelter costs really started to drive the CPI going up and the, the changes in shelter costs, that's, that's your housing, that's your rent were large enough that they overwhelmed the good news from, say, gas prices falling. So we actually saw that inflation um, essentially was unchanged. It rose just slightly on a year-over-year basis. And just to complete the picture, the most concerning item that I'm seeing in the CPI right now is that from March to July, we were watching what we call core CPI. That's the CPI after we subtract out food cost and energy cost. And we subtract those out because those are very volatile, right? Gas prices can go up and down because OPEC does something, you know? Uh, food prices can go up and down because there's a salmonella outbreak somewhere. So we were seeing these, these the CPI, less food and energy, what we call core CPI, going down. And it was doing that in July, so we were hoping and expecting to see core CPI continue to decline in August, and then we could start popping champagne, and that's not what happened. Core CPI actually had a pretty decent-sized jump. So headline inflation went down, driven by energy and gas prices. But core, that not volatile section, reversed the trend of declining and started and is now going back up. That That's really disappointing for someone like me who thought that, you know, we really should be getting over this hump now. We Let's put this in the context because we've been talking about the COVID stuff a lot. It's like what is involved there, what's not involved there. And then, of course, we talk about, you know, things that are outside of our control, like the war in Ukraine that Russia perpetrated against the Ukrainian people that they're now getting their butt kicked in. Thank God. Our friend Joey Politano actually put a really good chart together on this. And I'm going to link to this chart. So for the radio audience, though, I'm going to I'm going to 
explain it, but we'll put it on the screen for the YouTube folks. The pandemic prices, food, energy, core goods, core services, the four kind of big important things in your life, right? You can see on this chart, 2000, when the pandemic really bit, energy went through the floor. Of course, nobody's going anywhere, so energy prices go down. Um, core goods, the prices actually went down a little bit. Of course, not people aren't buying as much because they're not going out as much. Food prices were pretty level, and that all stayed pretty in line with before the, the pandemic. And then in spring of 2021, so the last 18 months really is what we're talking here, it just starts climbing. And energy is a big chunk of that. The food cost is a big chunk of that. The core goods is a big chunk of that. And then the core services underneath all that. You touched on it briefly, but the number that really threw everybody off was, is they're like, well, the energy cost is going to go down. That should bring everything else down. Well, the energy did tick down, but the food still went up and the core goods still went up and the core services still went up. And that's the problem here that's got everybody in a loop on this metric, isn't it? And and we're also looking at a rail strike happening in a few days, Andrew. Amtrak just came out and announced that they're basically shutting down their operations outside of the Northeast Corridor. We know it's going to affect freight prices. And uh, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but a lot of our goods move on freight, right? Maybe we forget that, but there's a lot of freight. Yeah, and I'm a transportation guy by trade, so I know that the intermodal ports are actually already shutting down because they have to cover what's called surge time. Uh, so they're already shutting down because they only got so much room to store stuff. So that this is like every every time like we think that we're getting through this thing, right? Something else pops up and you just sort of reset it again. It's very, very frustrating. You know, especially from those policy protections. Like, you know, you couldn't predict that we we're going to have this railroad strike happen. You know, that's going to affect food and it's going to affect appliance costs and other, and other sort of durable uh, goods items, right? Right. Now, this does blast a hole in one running narrative. It's like, well, this is all gas prices. I know when you've been on here before, you pointed to, well, it's energy prices and used cars are the kind of the two that you were looking at. Well, here that's not holding up now because now the energy prices are going down. Used car prices actually ticked down a little bit, which is good because they were the highest they've ever been in recorded history. It was very, very high. Both of those have gone down. That's not what's fueling the food and cost of living increases. So no. what is pushing it then? Well, um, some would say wages, right, uh, would be translating to that. And certainly if, if the price of labor is going up, that would cause uh, the price of goods to go up. Uh, I think it still seems that we're not out of our supply chain issues at all. So I, I think that that is still driving the, the price of these goods up, um, you know, and you know, we are still emptying our pocketbooks from the surplus of spending that we got uh, from the pandemic, right? And that amount of cash was flush in consumers' pockets, and folks had pretty good vibes about the uh, about their personal economy, not the national economy, but the personal economy. So they were spending, uh, and that helped drives things. That that helps drive costs up as well, you know. And then, you know, so I still think that those will shake out over time. And they should, but I think over time I need to now instead of thinking months, I might be talking a year or two. So I, I kind of have to own uh, a forecasting failure here, um, and at least own up to my mistake. Like, well, nope, this inflation is going to last a little bit longer th than I thought. By a little bit, I mean a year or two longer. And it, it's a bitter pill to swallow when you're an economist and you get something like that wrong. But own right. your mistakes. You're more credible if you do. Yeah, but the thing is, like we said, you've got data points now. So like, well, we thought energy prices was driving a lot of this. The energy prices changed. Everything else didn't change. That's a data point. Um, oh, by the way, yeah, Joey, so Joey Pal Pal Palatano, uh, Palatano. He, he writes for uh, it's Apricitas, A-P-R-I-C-I-T-A-S, for those watch, you know, listening. Um, and he's, his sub stack is well worth uh, the free subscription. And I would say it's worth the paid subscription, too. And uh, he's now a free man to uh, to talk a lot about this stuff. And um, if there isn't a rising star uh, below the age of 30 in, in economics that isn't named Joey, I don't know who it is. Yeah, um, we've already reached out to him. He's going to be coming on the show real soon. We're working that out. Um, thanks to your recommendation, by the way. Let's go through some of these numbers real quick because, again, this is a stats-heavy thing, so you need to explain it to us. Uh, we talked about what the chart looks like. Here's the actual numbers on it. I'm just going to go through these individually. 
you give me your comments on them. Mm -hmm. Um, most of this is year over year. So that kind of makes it understandable. So it's like, okay, this is the last 12 months compared to this time last year. Yep. Right. All right. Increases. This is directly from the economic news release. So this isn't spin. This isn't somebody's opinion. This is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Increases in shelter, food, and medical care indexes were the largest of many contributors to the broad based monthly all items increase. These increases were mostly offset by a 10.6% decline in the gasoline index. That's the energy we were talking about. The food index, now this is the one everybody's going to be talking about, continue to rise, increasing 0.8% over the month as the food at home index rose 0.7%. The energy index fell 5% over the month as the gas index declined, but the electricity and natural gas indexes increased. Those are a lot of big words and numbers. What does that say to you? What it, I mean, really what it comes down to is one. I, so the food thing is a little bit shocking. Again, you know, I was expecting for that to be resolving itself. It tells me that our economy has not figured out how to function post COVID. It tells me that we're still dealing with a lot of the shocks that, that we had that began with the COVID economy. Uh, and that quite frankly, we're going to get poor inflation readings probably for the rest of the year. That, that's my bot. I mean, Remember, I used to be pretty positive a few months ago, so I, I'm changing my tune a little bit. I'm a little bit disappointed. I don't see inflation shooting out of control or anything like that, but I think we're going to see inflation stay uncomfortably high. And the takeaway that everybody should have from that is, what is the Federal Reserve going to do? Well, um, I think the floor is a 75 basis point increase at their next meeting. That's going to raise the cost of borrowing for everybody. It's going to translate into higher mortgage prices in some respects going to translate to a lot of other higher prices um you know higher higher costs for for those for those items so you know they're gonna federal reserve is gonna you know we were hoping that maybe they would start tapering off their their rate increases um right because they're trying to do the soft landing they're trying to bring a plane down uh and land it without a whole lot of landing gear um basically some of their, you know, that, that landing's about to get a little bit rougher. It's going to be even more difficult to pull off that soft landing. Can they still do it? Yeah, they can. Is, are there some data points in favor of them? Yes, there are. But there's there's definitely a mounting number of data points that are saying it's going to be a lot more difficult. Yeah, there was some good news in here. Airfares were good. Uh, it was a massive travel year, which everybody kind of assumed it would be coming out of COVID. Everybody wanted to get out and move. It's been a really good tourism and travel year economically for folks so airfares were good communication that one was kind of interesting but again coming off of covid everybody kind of changed communication you figured that would do okay then the indicator you've been talking about ever since we started bringing you on the program used cars and trucks declined that was a big one because that was one that you called a pressure point kind of a thing of listen when the economy's bad used cars and trucks get really expensive because people are trying to get the cheaper one because they can't afford the new one that's your data point. That's the one you always told us to look at. Now that one actually looks good underneath all these bad numbers. What does that tell you? Well, it's starting to look better. It's still well above what we would consider normal inflation for the year over year change. For example, right, the uh, the used cars that Andrew's mentioning, they went down by 0.4 percentage points in July, month over month. And in August, they went down 0.1 percentage points month over month. Um, going, leading us to a a year-over-year uh, year year change from August to August of 7.8 percentage points. That is still high. You know, it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of downward movement in used cars to get you back to the baseline of where that would seem to be reasonable. You know, keep in mind we were coming off of May and June where used car prices month over month rose 1.8 and 1.6 percent. 0.1 declines ain't going to get you that much down. Yeah. Talking to our buddy, Stephen Popick. He is an economist. He's a good friend of ours. We always love talking to him. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to keep digging into these numbers. Uh, we're going to dig into the reaction to him. There's a couple reactions out there in the news media and social media that caught his attention. One of them's got him all kinds of fired up because he's like, send me this and ask me this, which is very unusual for him. So we're going to get into that more with Stephen Popak. We're Listen. This stuff is hard, and he explains it so well that even I understand it. We're going to keep doing that right after the break. Heard Tell continues.
Hi, uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. We got our buddy Stephen Popic with us. He's an economist. He's got all them fancy letters after his name, but he explains things really, really common sense wise, especially things that get loud on the internet, like when the CPI report comes out, like inflation, like economics. We love having him on. Um, let's talk about the reaction here because there was some of the narratives out of this that you just didn't care for. Um, this is actually out of the Census Bureau data, but it came out about the same time as the Labor and Bureau statistics. So they were kind of pancaking two things together here. Um, I won't use the name because I don't want to call one person out because I saw four different people had this exact same take on this. But the idea was that the U.S. middle class is, quote unquote, disappearing. And they said the higher income group shared household earnings goes went 100,000 plus is what we're talking about, tripled between 67 and 2001. Middle income households decreased and low income households increased. Just to correct you, it's from 1967 to 2021. Not 2021. 2000. Yeah, 2021. Excuse me. I'm I'm time shifted. I still think it's last year. My bad. Is the middle class decreasing, disappearing, whatever you want to call it, or is people fiddling with the numbers here and getting a narrative where there shouldn't be one? So, I mean, the numbers are right. We did have only 12% or so of households making 100,000 or more dollars, and that's in 2021 dollars. This, this, is, this is inflation adjusted, right? Making uh, the equivalent of $100,000 today back in 1967, and we see 36% of those, 36% uh, of households are making $100,000 more in 2021. Uh, and we see that, you know, when they define low income using the same metric and putting it all $2021, that the percentage for low income, you know, has changed a little bit. But really, the decline has been in the middle income bracket. 55% were middle income in 1967, down to 39% in 2021 on households. Now, yes, that's that's technically true, but the devil's in the details. And the detail is simply this. And I put it out there to, to, to Andrew when they said this. I said, wow. They have discovered that women started to work during the 60s, 70s, and 80s because you can look at the decline in the or the the decline in the middle class that they have the, the that these folks define and put the mirror image of women's labor force participation rising during that time. And since you're talking about household income, you're seeing the transition from a one male-dominated single-family income to a joint family, you know, two workers, you know, husband, wife, you know, cohabitating couples, you know, whatever, um, working together. So congratulations to these folks. Uh, you're saying the middle class is shrinking because women started working. I'm not sure that's the right message to have in an election year. Yeah, you pulled the numbers up from Fred. Um, so 1967 is the number they want to work on. Uh, women labor force participation rate was in the low 40s in 1967, depending on which number you want to use. By the by, 2010, it was bumping around 60 percent. It dropped down a little bit during the 2000s. And then in 2020, something really interesting happened. In the spring of 2020, all of a sudden, the wom women participation in the labor force dropped almost nine percentage points in a month. Did anything important happen in February, March, April of 2020 that might have precipitated that number there, economist? Absolutely nothing happened. Nope, nope. I didn't start working from home at that point. We weren't all scared about a, a pandemic going on. Uh, schools didn't close. Daycares didn't. No, no, nothing happened. Of course, we're talking about that's when COVID restrictions hit. Everybody started staying home. Children had to be home. Uh, of course, that hit especially working mothers hard. And multi-parent households changed quite a bit. By the way, that number still has not come. We've talked about things that have bounced back since COVID. That number's not back to pre-pandemic level. It's still off by about 4 or 5%, something to kind of keep an eye on as we're looking at these other numbers. Okay, back to the CPI for just a second, because this is the number that everybody probably feels the most acutely. It's, it's weird for something like Bureau and Labor Statistics to have kind of a, uh, a one-liner in a press release, but boy, this one had a little bit of punch to it. They said the food index increased 11% over last year, and it was already way, way up. We're talking about, um, you know, a massive raise already. The largest 12-month increase since the period ending in May of 1979. Put that in perspective, folks, I'm not even in utero yet. That's before I was even made, let alone born. That's a long time. People that don't remember, the late 70s was not exactly economic nirvana. That's a bad number and a bad comp to have on an official government release, yeah? 
Well, first off, I just discovered that uh, I'm just slightly older than uh, than Andrew here uh, because I believe I was in utero at that time. <laughs> Problem um, for the Popic family. Uh, something like that. Um, yeah, look, like some of this, like we did sort of expect, like you can't have a war go on in the breadbasket that basically feeds Eastern Europe and almost all of North Africa and expect for that not to have implications for worldwide food markets. You know? Um, and that's part of the, that, that's part of, of this issue. But, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, I think, I think we're seeing that farms are still having supply chain issues. We've had a pretty big drought out west where there's a lot of farming activity. Um, that's going to raise the price of crops over there. And spoiler, that kind of drought activity probably ain't going away anytime soon. Um, you know, that, that, that's just going to be a problem. So that's where we get a lot of our crops out there. So, yeah, um, those things together, you know, that explains part of why we've seen such high costs. And you can also think of like food costs might have been, this, some of this increase could be a lag because food prices had to adjust. And we know that energy prices spiked a few months ago. You got to get that food somewhere that costs energy, that costs gas. And so those those prices are obviously passed on, but you can't immediately raise prices, right? Uh, you can't you can't adjust that perfectly once once these prices of energy rise. You have to sort of do it in response to it a month later or two months. So some of that could be the fact that we saw food prices spike because we saw energy prices spike a few months ago. And so this is just things working its way through the system, contracts that could sign to to ship stuff out that were signed three months ago that are now being, you know, actually, you know, enacted, right? Because, you know, nobody, nobody says, can you ship, you know, a million tons of grain, you know, without having a contract set up, you know, nine, 90 days beforehand, right? That would be bad. Um, so that could be part of what we're seeing, but it is disappointing. And yeah, uh, everybody consumes food. So, you know, not everybody is, a, you know, uh, ha- needs to buy a car, but everybody's got to eat. You know, and I, I think I just, Again, we still have to caution, though, like there are about, you know, there are still very big differences in how Americans are experiencing inflation. Again, if you're a homeowner and if you're a white collar worker and you're getting to work from home a bit more than you used to, your personal inflation rate is definitely well below the national level that, that that's being reported. But if you're a working class person that has to drive, uh, has to, you know, buy food, you know, not, you know, and and maybe you have to go to McDonald's or, or you, you you have to just buy the prepackaged stuff at the grocery store um, and you're still, you know, putting miles on your car and things like that. Um, yeah, you're you're seeing and you're, you're seeing more inflation. You're seeing higher than the national average there. So. Let's just be mindful that, you know, there, there is a difference of experience, you know, that Americans are having. And I think that for folks that are thinking about, you know, what this means, I think you should try to think about putting yourself into the shoes of someone that is got a different job and in a different life than you, because they're going to be really thinking about things differently. And maybe that helps us bridge a little bit of the divide if we think about it like that. Last time we talked to you, uh, we were both hopeful that inflation was easing. Maybe we'd seen the worst of it. Um, what do these numbers do? Because like you said, some of these are going to be lagging indicators. Energy is always a lagging indicator. So this is really energy stuff from two, three months ago that we're seeing on this report. That food number, though, um, again, let's go back to the CPI for a second. What went up in these reports was shelter, medical care, household furnishing operations, vehicles, insurance, like those are the big ticket items in people's lives. Is there a danger that maybe we didn't see the plateau? Maybe this is going to have another bump or two up before we get done with it now? I think what I'd say to that is I don't have a bloody clue right now where this is going. I was convinced that we were getting over the hump. Um, I, I Push come to shove right now, Andrew. What I'm thinking is that We've got several more months of this thing sorting itself out. And so we'll probably continue to see some uncomfortably high prints. And we'll probably see the Federal Reserve continue to to raise their 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 federal funds rate. 
to try to stamp out that this inflation. Um, you know, they're basically trying to lessen business activity and, and lessen demand so that that sort of reduces money in the system. And that means that, you know, prices would come down or prices would remediate. Um, and essentially, they're, they're going to have, I mean, the, the risk for the Federal Reserve is that they do too much and they trigger a recession caused by their own actions, right? And that's five out of six times when the Federal Reserve has tried to engineer a soft landing in the last, you know, recessionary crises that we've had. Uh, they failed, and they triggered a recession. You um, just you just mentioned it, so let me ask you real quick. Two terms that we're starting to hear get thrown around a lot by economists and commentators about the current situation, especially since it's volatile, like you said. At least you, at least you said you didn't have a bloody clue. Usually you shrug and say Wu-Tang, so I appreciate you giving me a little bit more of a technocratic answer there. Um, money velocity of the dollar, how much the money's moving around. And cash buying power of the dollar is two things we're hearing a lot of underneath a lot of this other stuff right now. Is that something folks should be concerned at, or is that just kind of chatter under the noise? Turn the noise down on those kind of matters for us. I think if there's like primary and secondary levels of concern, that's probably a tertiary concern for everybody. You know, I mean, the the kitchen table issues are what most folks should be should be more concerned about. Um, you know, as you said, it was a great year to travel. Um, it's still a great year. To, it's still a great time to travel to Europe right now. We, we're seeing the euro is on par or essentially on par with the dollar. That's not normally the case. European vacations are really cheap right now for us. So, um, you know, if you have the ability to do it, you should. Now, of course, not many people do. Um, or some people don't, right? You know, significant swaths. So we should be mindful of that. That's kind of like, yay, thanks. You, you gave me something I can't use. You know, I, 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 um, I struggle for words given that I, I but used to be part of team trans, transitory inflation. And, you know, it seems that this is just stuck around for a while. So I think the biggest thing that we need to watch is how investors and the, and the market as a whole respond to the words and actions of Chairman Powell and how they try to navigate it um, to engineer a softer landing where we don't have what he's trying to do is get inflation to come down without a huge uptick in the unemployment rate, which really, of course, hurts people a lot more than I think inflation does, right? At least you still have a job. At least money's still coming in. But, you know, that this is the tricky part. You have to slow down the economy, but you don't want to slow it down so much that you trigger a recession. And, and Powell's trying to be, you know, trying to do something that's only been successful one of the last six times. Not a good standard to base off of. Uh, real quick, We've talked the economic side. There is, of course, the political side of this. The next batch of numbers we're going to get, we're going to get the end of the fiscal year numbers right as we go to vote here. Uh, early voting is actually going to be starting here before people even really realize it here. Politically. Nobody, nobody cares about fiscal numbers. Deficit spending is here to stay. Let's just everybody be real on that. <laughs> Are you done now? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but seriously, though, I, I take your point, but... You know, the, the economy is going to be the number one issue, especially the, this cost of living stuff isn't going to be fixed by the next batch of numbers. It's just not there. Even even if you had a record change down, it would still be high politically. How much both ways now, you know, how much does the reporting affect the economy and how much is the election going to affect these economic numbers? Because the economy is going to react to the election, whichever way it goes. Right. Usually it does. Yeah. I think that, though, the economy is going to basically I mean, I think, the you know, the reaction to the election. The White House isn't changing this time around. There's no election for the White House, right? It's either it's Congress, and there's not a scenario on the books where Republicans get 60 senators, right? And so we're still going to be in a land where there's a Senate, you know. I assume with a with a with a filibuster, so that you know the normal spending routine is, is going to be continuing. There's no threat of like massive cuts in government spending. There's no threat of massive changes in government programs. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's probably going to mediate sort of any sort of e econ reaction. Most, most, most folks are pricing in right now, a Republican house uh, and a Senate that's either 49 Dems, 50 Dems or 51 Dems. You take your pick, which one of those it is, but practically speaking, they're all the same thing. Now, are you daring to say that congressional gridlock is good for the economy? I have a political philosophy that's my personal belief that divided government is good government. 
Uh, I'm not I'm not against it in principle, but there's some specifics I need to know before I jump into that end of the pool. You understand? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah. I just generally think like the if you have divided government, the worst of the worst ideas can't possibly get across the desk to the president to be signed, and that if you have fully unitary government of one party, really bad ideas could get across the desk to the president to sign. Yeah. Unless you have a pandemic and then they just jam through all kinds of stuff. But we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, Stephen Pavic, we love having you on. You make this stuff really understandable. Looking forward to getting you on on some other topics we're gonna, we've are gonna we been talking to you about. We'll get you back on. Uh, until then, let folks know where they can follow you under your real name now. You're still under the same handle on yep. Twitter, but you've got a few other things in the fire now that you're out in the public and you're all out and famous and such. Don't forget us, the little people. Until we see you again on Hurt Tell, let folks know where they can find you. Very, very, very tiny famous. Uh, you can find me as Metal Economist on, on Twitter, and you can look up my research on mortgage lending that's now available. Uh, you can, if you look up Stephen Popic uh, and mortgage, you'll see one of my most recent research papers that looks at whether or not there's still differences in the mortgage market uh, between minority and non-minority borrowers. And spoiler alert, we still see some. We don't learn anything, do we? The same. Life is a circle. We keep going around and around and around. A flat circle of that. Stephen Pavic, love having you, buddy. Talk again soon, sir. You too, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Welcome back to Heard Tell. So you might have heard tell that there's been some trouble with the nation's railroads, logistics, transportation. I get to put up my old box kicker hat on. I'm a transportation guy by trade. Let's talk about it because this is important. Why would a logistics uh, upset like a rail strike be a big deal right now? Well, because the logistic calendar runs different than everybody else's calendar. So right now, this period before Thanksgiving, September, October, November, if you think about one of the busiest commerce seasons of the year, Christmas, this is when all that stuff starts really shipping. It comes in from overseas, and a lot of that stuff moves by what's called intermodal. That's, you know, through shipping and then by rail all through the U.S. The other thing you need to remember about this sort of thing is most of the rail system, especially out west, most of the railroad tracks are privately owned and they're owned by the freight companies, not the passenger service. So that's one of the reasons passenger service is subservient to rail and a lot of things. Needless to say, as we learned during COVID and other things during the last few years, supply chain shortages happen quick, disruptions happen quick, and a freight rail strike can mess up a whole lot of things. Amtrak, by the way, already slowing down their scheduling of long distance trains. Now, I don't want to be doom and gloom about this too much because I think this one actually probably gets settled pretty quickly. I think you're going to have a strike. I think you get a week or two of mostly performative uh, airing of grievances, but I think they get this done for a couple of reasons. One is, the ask by the workers here is actually not all that outrageous. They're mostly over things like PTO time, paid time off, things like that. Benefits, of course, things like that. Also, politically, there's an enormous amount of pressure. In fact, we're going to read from the Washington Post here in just a minute. Uh, they're already pulling the negotiators in. The government's going to be leaning on them really, really hard to settle this. And even though the Biden administration is very pro-labor, the last thing they need is an economic disruption right here before the midterms. There's going to be a lot of pressure for everybody to get this thing settled. I think it gets settled decently quickly, probably within a few weeks. But let's delve into it and turn the noise down on it. Washington Post, freight railroad companies and unions representing workers have been locked in a dispute over pay and working conditions <laughs> since the dawn of time. But, you know, for purposes of the discussion, that's not in the Washington Post. That was me saying that as somebody that's worked in logistics all his life. And come Friday, the conflict could spill over into a logistical crisis affecting not only commuters who rely on railway to get to work, but also the nation's energy supply and drinking water. While a presidential board has urged a compromise, two of the largest unions representing 57,000 conductors and engineers have not agreed to the deal, who could prompt a major strike on the railroads to lock out passenger rail service agencies and workers. On Wednesday, Labor Secretary Marty Walsh is hosting emergency meetings of the rail carriers and the unions to try to help broker a deal. The impasse is tied to disagreements between management and labor over sick time and penalties for missing work, a politically challenging stalemate, 
President Biden, who aims to advocate for union workers, but has prioritized untangling the nation's besieged infrastructure in the COVID area. Uh, there's a couple things to need to know. The critical issues here um, are workers up to termination, paid attendance policies, routine doctor's visits, kind of the normal um, benefits stuff. They want 14 consecutive days without a break that they can be on call. They think that's too severe and they do need a single sick day paid or unpaid. This is a quote from the union, quote, all we're asking for is folks to be able to go to routine doctor's visits without pay, but they have refused to accept our proposals. Now, this is the union angle, of course. Uh, we have guys who were pushed for taking, punished for taking time off for a heart attack and COVID. It's inhuman. Uh, when could the strike begin? This is again from the Washington Post. The federally mandated cooling off period ends Friday. So that's when people are thinking the strike could start. Uh, the nationwide rail shutdown is set to go into effect after midnight on Friday, and the Biden administration has already begun preparing for a potential crisis. Um, hundreds of Amtrak passengers had their plans ruined Tuesday after the railroad canceled more cross-country trains ahead of possible strikes. Remember, especially out west, freight has priority over passenger because they own most of the rail lines. Um, if the strike isn't averted, commuter lines that run between major cities and suburbs could be affected. Strike could have a significant impact on retailers who rely on freight rails to transport inventory from the ports to the warehouse and distribution centers. The shutdowns would have a domino effect. Retailers would miss their shipping and pickup dates, leaving cargo in limbo without a place to go. Listen, we already know how this works. We saw it during COVID. Stuff ain't moving. There's only so much storage spaces. Then you get ships sitting offshore. It has a domino effect takes a long time to unwind, and we are getting into the season where stuff for Christmas is starting to ship. So, yeah, this could be bad in a hurry. But, again, I'm hopeful. I think they get this worked out decently quickly, hopefully in a week or two, and it doesn't get too awful ugly. You never know with labor situations, though, so we will see. Uh, something to keep an eye on the railroad strike. Don't panic. Just keep yourself informed, and we'll go from there. More Hertel right after this. The other looming thing, especially in the Western press, has been Megan. Now, there's all kinds of rumors and stuff. I don't want to speculate, and I don't want to get into all the rumors of who said what to who and the internal workings of the rural family, because, God, you'd be months and years, and there's there's a whole cottage industry for that stuff if people yeah. want to view it. Do you think the Megan thing gets better now? Do you think they figure out a way, especially now that William and Kate's going to be kind of elevated because they're next in line? Um, do you think the Megan thing works itself out now? I think it depends on how they... I think I think it's up to them personally. Uh, there is a lot of bad blood. There's a lot. You know, probably, probably. I think my my understanding, Meghan and Harry are fed up from the US, whereas here, um, you know, it's, it's quite divided. But I think it it would depend on how they act. I think it depends on if the sense here seems to be is that Harry and Meghan are a bit too eager to sort of, you know, be in the spotlight. They, you know, he claimed that he wanted to get away from the spotlight, and he's been in it a lot. Um, and I think if they play their cards right, they, that's fine. But I think they've got to be very careful and they've got to not um, be seen as trashing the royal family, especially especially if they do it soon after the Queen's died, because you don't that 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 would be a very bad look. If they start coming out with all kinds of tell all interviews or whatever, that's that would be terrible. Um, so I think it depends on and it's not just Megan. Harry Harry is just as much to blame, if not more so, because Harry remember in fact Harry's more to blame because Harry was brought up around this. He knows his responsibilities. Megan wasn't. You know, she obviously married into it and it wasn't for her. But Harry should know, you know, how to conduct himself and how what's expected of him. And I think it's it's his responsibility now to make sure that is that the pressure happens. off him now. Well, no, it's not. The pressure's never the pressure's never going to be off him. The pressure will always be on him. Um, but I think he, yeah, I, I hope that you know he, I hope for him and William and Charles can reconcile because I've, I know there's apparently been some sort of. I don't yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speculate now, but... on it, but you said there's bad blood there. There's conflicting, you know, is it with William? Is it with his dad? Was it with his grandmother? 
who was the bad blood even with? Do we even know? Because everybody assumes there's bad blood, but we don't really even know. So it's kind of hard to tell. I know they made a big deal over the one wedding. Uh, they attended Philip's funeral together. They were The brothers were walking together. People were trying to like do the body language thing, which is a waste of time. It was a funeral. They weren't going to give you anything in that moment. <laughs> I, I think I think the sense of it is is the here anyway. I think people just want it worked out and left alone. I get the feeling maybe in the UK it's a little bit more. Let's put it this way: Charles's speech as king, his first address, that line of as they live as they live their lives overseas. There's not one period in that statement that was not gone over. That was a very deliberate thing to say, was it not? Mm, I think just, I think I picked up on it immediately when he said. Oh, over he said William and Kate Prince of Wales and Harry and Meghan as they live their lives overseas. That sounded like a message to me. I think the message there probably was was, you know, you can do your own thing, but please don't please don't, you know, make this a sideshow. Um, please be keep it respectful. And, you know, whether they do or not, I don't know. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, um it's you know, Charles is King now. The, the focus still will be on him. Um, I just hope that there isn't. I think it's. Like, I think he's got. He's got to. It's a tough job to keep this family together because the royal family, like all families, you know, has its feuds, and it's not easy to keep that sort of thing together. And the Queen did hold together, and whether Charles will be able to continue that, I don't know. But certainly, his speech was was excellent, and I think he was. He's got. He's got off to a great start for all the reasons. Well, let, he said. let's just call it what it is, though. All the charity stuff, all the formalities, all the roles of being a head of states, at least ceremonially, that's all one. He's really going to be judged on whether he keeps his family together or not. That's really what he's going to be judged on, because if you really think about it, all the accolades of the queen the last 70 years, you've heard it over and over again. The consistency, the steadfastness, that's the stuff everybody's talking about. His success or failure rate and how his legacy goes is all going to be about whether he keeps his family together, and he's got a tough task on it. Is that a fair way to phrase all this? Yes, but I think it's also about whether he keeps the Commonwealth together. Uh, I think, you know, if there's referendums you know, on this issue in, say, Australia, New Zealand, or Canada, or wherever, I think it's it's what happens now to the Commonwealth because there is an expectation that the Commonwealth will base as an organisation where you know he's head of state. There's an expectation that it will just sort of disintegrate, like the empire did. Now that the queen isn't there because the queen's so popular and he isn't as popular. Uh, I think how he conducts himself now and you know in the, in the coming years will define that. And if he actually manages to hold it hold it together, you know, he may be seen as a very good king. Uh, he won't. He will never. He will never top his mother, obviously. But um, depending on how he conducts himself now, that will be, I think, how he's judged. Just as much as if he keeps the family together, I think he's going to keep the family together, but also keep the Commonwealth family together is just as important. And it's quite a big deal to a lot of people in not just here, but in the Commonwealth as well. What? Give me one or two things that would make or break that. Do you think? Does he need to do overseas tours? Does he have certain policies that he needs to advocate for? We know he's really big about environmental concerns, things mm -hmm. like this. That's going to be a little bit of a hard road to hoe right now in the middle of an energy crisis. So he's maybe not the man of the hour for that specific thing. What's a couple of the things he needs to come right out of the block strongly on policy and ideology wise to broadcast to the Commonwealth, but really to the rest of the world as well, as far as what he's going to be focusing on? Well, he needs to go, he needs to go on a tour um, and he will do. I mean, I've, I think it's already been, I think basically already confirmed that he will go on a tour of the Commonwealth realm. So he'll go to Australia, he'll go to New Zealand, he'll go to Canada, he'll go to the Caribbean and all those other places and you know, parts of Africa, he will go there. Um, so I think he needs to do that and he will. Um, as far as his causes that he advocates for, he's already made it clear that he wants to be more of an advocate for things that, than his mother was. Um, you know, she was famously, no one knew what she thought about anything really. She was very tight-lipped. That was the way she was and that's the way she wanted it. I think he needs to, it's hard for him actually because he's going to have to avoid being stuck in the culture wars because the Queen obviously could, could stay above it, whereas he hasn't. He's always sort of he's often been sort of drawn into the cultural wars, and I think um, sort of managing that balancing act will be very difficult because everything gets consumed by the cultural war these days. And you know, either he either he'll get you know either get painted as a woke person or a, you know a, a racist or a fascist or whatever. That that'll be what happens. You know, he's got to avoid being painted as one of two extremes in the culture wars. And you know, I really do wish him the best on that because that's a tough job for anyone to do. To stay out of that mess is, is, you know, it's not it's not a mess of his making. It's a mess of society's making. He's got to stay out of it. How much of that does? Last time I had you on, we were talking a lot about how the British media is changing the news media specifically in England. How much of that's going to have to do with the media environment? Because it is it. We already talked about it. they've done a good job managing the media in recent years. 
this is going to be a whole new thing now because it, it almost the queen was such an institution about not giving an opinion that they basically quit trying to get one for lack of a better way of phrasing it. They're going to be all over Charles trying to get that sound bite out of him. There's a lot of trappings there. They're going to test, you know, for lack of a better term, not that they're not going to be disrespectful. They're going to test this new king in mm-hmm. this media environment. How much does that have to do with this as well? Do you think? Cause the well, British press has never had a monarch that they felt like they could go after. Cause the queen was kind of untouchable. There, there. Let's be fa- let's be fair here. The British media is going to kind of be licking their chops a little bit. Like, okay, we can go after this guy, right? I think I think you're right. But I think if I was advising him, and I think he will take this on board, I think I would say to him, um, "Don't give them what they want. Don't feed them. Just you know, maybe step back a little bit from what you're used to, um, because you know they're going to they, you know they're going to spin it however they want. They 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 want you know they want blood. They want sexy scandals. That sort of thing." Um, so I think he, and I think it's in his interest for him, for him to not give them that because he knows that the survival of the monarchy, probably in the long term, will in part depend on that. I don't think there's any real chance of, of the monarchy, you know, not being around in 50 years time, but it, it, there could be a slow death over the coming sort of centuries. And I think he needs to, to not give them the kickstart they need because, because, because the tabloids just, they just want a story. That's, that's all we ever want. All, all news organizations are like that. They just want a story. They want something to write about. And I would just say to him, don't give it to them. Yeah. And that'll do it for Hertel for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, however you're watching or listening to the program, leave us a comment, leave us a rating. Those are really important. Let folks know our programs we're checking out. If you want to get with us directly, do you have a story that you think isn't getting covered? Do you think we didn't cover something right? Uh, we've had whole segments and shows over how you wanted something covered or touched on. We've had g- guests come on that reached out to us because they didn't like how we covered something, gave them their speech. Uh, keep your bearing. Be nice. But we'd love to hear from you at Hertel Show on gmail.com. Hertel Show on the Twitter. We would love to hear from you. Please do reach out uh, wherever you are across the street or around the world. We hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. And we'll talk to you again real, real soon on Hertel. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. So